Robert and I thought we'd each talk for five or ten minutes and each talk about different issues dealing with Next Era and HECO. And then we'd open it up to Q&A because it's most important to get interaction going. I want to focus on three issues. The first is the process. You may know that on December 3rd, Next Era proposed taking over Hawaiian Electric and calling it a merger. And it did, the process does not have a definite end date. It was originally Next Era wanted to end it in December, and then it was, why don't we take it out to June? And recently, the chair of the Public Utilities Commission said, June is simply a target date. The most important thing is that we resolve the issues and we make sure we make the right decision. Now, in terms of complexity, this is the biggest and most complex proceeding that the state has ever dealt with. It is more parties, more lawyers, more issues than Waiahole, which lasted the better part of a decade. It's still going on. Still going on, but the important thing is we're trying to scrunch <coughs> Waiahole and a half into a year and a half. And so if you think about a piece of paper being a millimeter thick, and you stack what has been filed so far, the public pages are 16 feet tall. So where we are now is that in October 27th, the PUC is going to come to, Hawaii, to this island after having been to all the other islands and ask for your input. They are not looking to see how many citations you can cite they're not looking to see how many documents you can reference. There are 30 parties in the docket. We all have legal rights within the docket. We're the ones who are going to be arguing the case one way or the other. Rather, the Public Utilities Commission wants to know what the general sense is from the community. So they want to know how many individuals and how many organizations are for, against, or somewhere in the middle. So definitely, if you have an organization, you want to come out and say the organization feels one way or another. Maui was the first time an organization has come out and said the merger is good. The Maui Hotel Association, or whatever it's called, said, why not? Um, so October 27th is a really important date. And we do not advocate that you say one thing or another thing. You should each say what's on your mind, um, because that's what the purpose of these hearings are. The purpose is not for the interveners to get up and espouse what we believe in. We have a full-blown evidentiary case coming, which the Public Utilities Commission has just agreed that there can be as many media attending as you want to. You have to file by mid-November saying you want to be there, but they're going to open it up and invite the media in. The room is 60 feet by 60 feet at the Neil Blaisdell Center. It's going to have to be big because there needs to be at least 30 tables with a working microphone on each one so parties can object to what other parties are saying. So it's going to be a really interesting gathering. And I have always found evidentiary hearings at the Public Utilities Commission really exciting. It was back in, a, I think it was 2006, when we cross-examined a HECO witness, and HECO for the first time said, you know, climate change is real and it's caused by fossil fuels. So it, it, evidentiary hearings can be exciting. It's where you get to ask questions of each of the other witnesses and you can lead them on. On when, when like HECO was cross, asking their own qu witness a question, you, they have to restrict it to like, if, what color was the light when you reached it, whereas cross-examining is like, was it yellow or was it red <laughs> when you went through it? So it's a more of an interaction, a low hostile interaction. Now, in determining whether next era is good or bad, I think, at least for life of the land, there are two overriding issues among all of, all of the different issues. One has to do with values. Do you value Aloha? Do you value Ohana? Do you value the Aina? Or do you value money? Next Era is money driven. They have received specific funding, not general tax breaks, not overall tax policy,
but specific funding aimed specifically at them. They've received $1.9 billion over the last several years in federal tax breaks. What did they do when they received $1.9 billion and ranking second in the nation among all renewable energy companies going after this federal money? They sued the federal government charging they weren't getting enough. <laughs> they have eight different law firms in the federal government at the federal level to lobby to get tax breaks. And Bloomberg said they pay one of the lowest tax rates of any company in the U.S. So if they simply want your money any way they can get it. And that comes down to the values. Their idea is how can we minimize the cost that we produce electricity for and maximize the amount of money we get so we get a big profit margin. And so, for example, they a uh, financial institution in the Cayman Islands because over the years, in the last three decades, he's worked on 29 mergers. That's his specialty. He specializes in figuring out how one company can screw another company and make money out of it. And he has a very nice house in Florida with no solar on it because that's not the focus. The focus is on money. So that's one major problem I have with the next era deal. We don't want to switch our local values to saying that money is the driver for everything. The second thing is they believe in a monolithic block. That is, there is no need to deal with other people and other entities. If you want to power Florida with natural gas and you want liquefied or you want natural gas brought in because Florida doesn't have any natural gas, you buy a, or invest in Oklahoma. You build wells in Oklahoma. You own the wells in Oklahoma. You build the pipelines to Florida. You own the pipelines of Florida. You bring the power into Florida. You don't buy power from others. You control everything. And that's how come the, the company can say, on the one hand, we really like wind, and on the other hand, say, so they are driven by money, and they're driven by the idea that they have to be everything. In fact, their stated goal is they want to be the largest utility in the United States. That is why right now they want to buy Hawaii Electric for $4 billion, Encore in Texas for $18 billion, and spend $13 to $20 billion building a nuclear reactor in Florida. They just want to pour money in and become as big and powerful as possible. <clears throat> Take it away. mentioned the fact that the media are going to be covering the next air hearings and that was almost solely because of his efforts and there's a number of other situations within this hearing where he's been the lone voice arguing for something and actually had the PUC say yeah we should do that so he's been a really tremendous force in this merger and obviously in energy in general so I'd just like to recognize that you know you really have someone really great here talking so <laughs> I was going to open up with sort of a joke about where else would you want to be on a Saturday night talking about <laughs> energy. <laughs> um, but then I started thinking, you know what, I really shouldn't make fun of this. This is probably one of the most important decisions Hawaii is going to make in the next 10, 20 years. <clears throat> uh, we are at a fundamental crossroads that really impacts the lives of people living in Hawaii. The average person spends 9% of their budget on energy, right? So it impacts the economy, it impacts low income, it impacts all sectors. And so, you know, John Muir had that famous quote, if you tug at anything in the forest, you find it's connected to everything else. This is one of those threads that really intersects everything else. And so good energy policy <coughs> can really have tremendously <coughs> positive ramifications elsewhere, vice versa, bad energy policy much like Hawaii pays two to three times more for its electricity than any other place in the United States, that that is you know, fundamentally impacting all of us, you know, whether we have the money to send children to a, slightly, you know, a better schooling opportunity or you know, whatever, you know, fill in the blank. So this is a really important thing. So I am 
very thankful that you're here, and I also recognize that there's a reason why you're here, so thank you. Um, much like Henry, I just want to touch on a couple different points, and I may kind of go through them a little bit quicker than you'd like, and if you'd like to follow up questions, please, you know, ask. I really prefer, both of us, I think, prefer the informal you know, question and answer, so that's why we're here. Um, I view the next era transaction like a job interview, and much like a job interview, one thing that you would ask is what are your plans going forward? What are you going to do? And there have been question after question after question to Next Era saying, so what are you going to do? What is it going to look like? And they basically <coughs> said, well, we can't tell you. We're not going to tell you. We like the eco plans, you know, those plans that have been universally criticized and generally speaking rejected by the PUC. But we're not going to tell you what their plans are. And you can have a bit of sympathy for that, right? If they're going to propose something like, we can make electricity cheaper, so those efficiency stuff isn't good. Um, they uh, created a docket to look at solar in Florida, you know, and they recognize there's not enough solar, so what can we do to bring in more solar in Florida? And they let in labor parties, they let in different groups, or thing. Uh, the organization that I uh, am affiliated with, which is the Alliance for Solar Choice, attempted to intervene in. And we were the only party that they fought to keep out. And they argued, well, hey, look, there's no solar in Florida, so therefore you have nothing, you have no standing. You can't come into Florida here and, and talk. Even though this docket's about the future of solar and how we bring in more solar. And lo and behold, we were kept out. And, you know, of course, not much came out of this docket because you didn't have anybody who had sort of that clean energy experience. So I can go on. I mean, there are a lot of specific examples in Florida where things are, are problematic, but perhaps, you know, you know, some of the quick highlights, like for example, uh, you know, the $1 million super PAC just created to help support Jeb Bush, who, when he was the governor of Florida, had really helped them assign specific commissioners that are favorable to them, and got a lot of great decisions as a result of sort of that influence, and so now they're supporting him through the presidency. Um, there is the $1.7 billion that ratepayers have had to spend to build a nuclear power plant that's never been completed, never will be completed, that the repairs just now, you know, lost that money. There's the money that's being allocated to do fracking <coughs> that rate payers on the hook for. That if anything goes wrong, it's the rate payers that get stuck with that. Anyway, I, I could go on, but I'm gonna try and stop, right? There's problems with the past record. So job interview, your past record doesn't look so good and you're not really promising anything in the future. So there's issues here. But even if this wasn't next era, I would still have some concern because of a faulty business model that here, California, New York, and a number of different places, states are having the conversation saying the way utilities, electricity utilities are set up is problematic. You know, it is a state-sponsored monopoly that's supposed to serve the public interest, and yet they are compensated, paid more for essentially the more electricity they sell. So therefore, their interests are in building bigger power plants, building lots of things, and getting paid a rate of return on it over time. So when we have conversations about reducing the amount of electricity sold, or maybe allowing people to have more consumer choice, you could build or develop your own power through solar or some other way. It's contrary to the entire business model. So their interest is sometimes misaligned with the public interest. And when you have a monopoly, this is problematic. So, in that case, what are our tools? How do we fix this? Well, you could do more regulation, but regulation by itself is a imperfect tool, right? And it's really hard. Sometimes you can stop people from doing something bad. Thou shall not screw the customer. It's a lot harder to tell people what to do through regulation. So, you have that kind of imperfect tool. You could try to open up more competition, right? So, if you look at the communications industry, which there's a lot of uncanny parallels here, where essentially we now have, if, if AT&T isn't doing what you like, you can now go to like T-Mobile or Sprint or something else and get service, um, and you know, if, or the third option, you know, if that shall, and obviously let me be quite um, candid, competition is also sometimes a faulty and irregular tool, you can still be screwed even when there's competition, so let me, <coughs> recognize I'm not trying to be an advocate for unlimited or unbridled competition. But 
the third option would be is potentially looking at a public ownership of, of an entity and seeing if that can provide a service, much like a border water supply provides water or department transportation gives you the roads that you need more of just a direct service. Their only interest fundamentally should be public, what is in the public interest. And in that, you know, we can look nationally that there are a number, there's thousands of municipality owned utilities, uh, thousands of cooperative owned utilities that are essentially owned by the people. And I think there's enough there that we have to seriously consider this, particularly when we're in this type of crossroads. I'm not trying to sell this as a, this is the best option, one we should do, but it's plainly one that we really have to take a good look at. Uh, on average, these utilities have uh, rates that are about 14% lower than rates set by a private company. And part of the reason is they, generally speaking, have access to lower cost of capital. They tend to pay CEOs less and they tend to reinvest the money they make back into the infrastructure, and so over time the savings are greater versus uh, not doing that reinvestment. Um, I can continue on, but I sort of want to maybe take a break there and maybe say, you know, if Henry, if you want to come stand here, maybe we can open up to questions and see uh, what people are uh, curious about. But first we should thank Robert for his question. <laughs> raised by Next Era was um, most shareholders of HECO don't live in Hawaii and therefore you simply the shareholders elect who's on the board and the majority don't live here so what's the difference? Well, shareholders are stamped the board is select and right now the board is made up of predominantly people you meet in the food store who live locally here that you see on the street whereas what Next Era is that all the major decisions should be made 4,800 miles from here. So there are bigger, <clears throat> if you picture, HECO is, is not quite caring, if you want to use that term. <laughs> Do other things to make it cheaper, cleaner, and hey, we'll show up to your community board meetings because we now care about what the community thinks of us because that's how we're getting paid. It's somewhat like realigning the structure by which they, they look at this, you know, could be helpful. But, you know, the concerns about Nextera, you know, all the same concerns, but more, right? In Florida, there's roughly two lobbyists for every legislator coming out of the, the, the um, utility industry. Uh, they are ruthlessly efficient and good at playing a political game and really getting the things that they want through in a way that HECO's never really done. So, and go on, but I mean, it's sort of a yeah, you know, the ego might be the devil is this size, you know, next to the devil is this size. And that's, you know, part of the concern. And, and one of the ways it was stated by some people was, uh, Hiko is big, but their claws aren't very sharp. <laughs> next era is a lot bigger, and they really practice sharpening their claws. I was wondering about um, you, Robert, what you were talking about, like, Kauai has a co-op. And or municipality-run energy um, organization. Um, are there any models that
that Hawaii might be aligned with the size of Hawaii's needs? Sure, and, and I think Henry can chime in on this too. I mean, the one that I've been using a lot as an example is got the unfortunate name of SMUD, <laughs> Sacramento, Sacramento Municipal Utility District. It serves about 1.4 million customers, so about comparable to the size of the state of Hawaii. Obviously, <clears throat> one geographical area, so there's some differences, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, the past 14 years, it's gotten the highest customer satisfaction ratings nationally, you know, consistently, um, doing a lot of innovative things, like installing electric vehicle chargers themselves, actually smartphone apps where you can actually track your electricity, you know, sort of being innovative, uh, flexible, doing it in ways that I think are national leading. But the thing that impressed me the most, they have regular community meetings and they show up to neighborhood board meetings. Why? Because that's who they serve, right? Like at the end of the day. And by comparison, and I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to demonize uh, the utility, but I think by comparison, the utility serves the PUC who approves their rate, rate increases, improves their projects, that's who their customer is. A little less here because you just have to buy the power. If their rates are high, rates are low, you just have to buy their power. So I think the transparency and accountability that happens with a publicly owned utility is refreshing and perhaps something that would help, particularly as we're kind of in this crossroads situation. And, and the example I would use is Boulder, Colorado, because Boulder has a private utility right now and Boulder is working, the community is working to privatize and make the private utility basically a public utility. Uh, the utility outspending them 10, 20 to one, but unfortunately the community, from the utility's perspective, unfortunately the community is popular. Their, their efforts are popular, and therefore they're in a transition state right now to figure out how you create a public utility from a private utility. and. So it's, they're, they're it's the private and they want to become public. Well, no, they want to displace the private one. They're, and they're doing a, a, a process by which they're creating a publicly owned utility. So they're kind of going <clears> through <throat> what we're talking about. They're in the middle of it. And, and they've been out to Maui to energy conferences explaining their process and interacting with people in, in this state to talk about how you would transition from a private to a public. Been very patient with that. And I keep getting more questions because you keep getting some stuff. And so um, the first thing that struck me about what you said was the difference between uh, for-profit hospitals and for-patients for hospitals. And the, the public utilities look a whole lot like Humana, a whole lot like for-profit hospitals. People making profits out of things that they shouldn't be making profit for for-profit prisons, mm -hmm. um, which we are now living in, by the way. Um, my question is, I worked a bit with uh, Keiko Bonk. Some of you folks know Keiko here. She's in my district, unfortunately not elected yet. Um, and she pointed out that if you have a monopoly that has both the, the production and the distribution of electricity, you're in, you're in, you're in trouble. And is it so I have two questions. One, is it possible to split production from distribution is that part of the solution? Secondly, how to turn a private uh, operation or public operation? Is this an area where eminent domain can be used? Yeah, a lot wrapped into that. And if you, the very first part where you kind of said the difference between a publicly owned hospital and a privately owned hospital, and you can obviously find examples of badly run publicly owned sure. hospitals and badly run privately run hospitals. So I'd like to sort of frame this in. You know, if you look at the history of this this issue, you know, there's been definitely like sort of you know flip flops. You know, like you know throughout the United States. What's different now is that we have these disruptive technologies coming on, like solar, where you know you can now potentially well, I wouldn't say potentially. It's very real, particularly in the neighborhood islands. You can go off the grid with solar and storage cheaper than buying power from Pico. Like this is fundamental transformation, and we're sort of in the crossroads of transformation. We also see that renewable energy is now, generally speaking, the cheapest form of electricity you can buy. Cheaper than coal, cheaper than oil, cheaper than gas. And so we're going to be rebuilding a lot of this, and should it be heat building it, somebody else is going to do it cheaper and better. So we're going through this crossroads transformation, and the reason why we're talking about business models and maybe going publicly owned is you know, there's a lot more there than just simply saying is one 
structure better than the other. This one here, the model we've had, is broken. We have suggested a split between generation and transmission that the everybody rejected flat out. It was, I guess, premature, but it was an idea coming. It, in answer, for co-ops across the United States, on Indian reservations, <coughs> in Hawaii, and in Alaska, co-ops own both generation and distribution. All other co-ops in the United States are either distribution co-ops or generation co-ops. So a, a group of distribution co-ops will buy power from a generation co-op. So they're sort of related, they have contractual relationships, but they are separate. And we, we need to actually say one step further because it's not, you're not necessarily going to have one distribution co-op per island. So for example, if you look at Fort Shafter right now, they have a microgrid, a grid where if the HECO grid goes down, they can stay up. But they also have a microgrid inside their microgrid. So, if the, so they can separate into component microgrids. So it might be that the future is like a bicycle. You have a whole bunch of microgrids that control local power within regions, and you have a transmission spine that connects them. So you could have a, a one generation company that goes out and makes the contracts with all the big independent power, wind companies, solar companies, H power, and all that, and then individual communities like Manoa could say, well, we're going to control the power within Manoa, and we're going to um, handle all the, we're going to create our board, and we're going to handle all the rates and everything within our community. And if the HECO grid goes down, instead of your valley going dark, you just throw the switch, and you stay light when everybody else is dark. And in fact, the University of California, San Diego, did that. All of Southern California, Arizona, parts of Arizona and New Mexico went dark a few years ago, and their campus was a beam of light. Probably in more ways than one, but uh, to, to uh, 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 loosely wrap up, uh, the other question you asked was about condemnation and uh, in domain. Yeah, in yeah, so, uh, my belief is that if this merger were to fail, that HECO is likely to go through a lot of realignment, right? Like the HECO today is going to have to change. I think we've said that publicly. Um, probably a smaller company, maybe splitting all sorts of things, leadership changes. So we're going to change no matter what. You know, I think there's two avenues that the three want to buy our offices and our people and all this other stuff. And then you usually go through litigation, you fight about it for a while. At some point, there's a resolution. It's sort of the most unpleasant way, but clearly the state has this big stick where they can say, we can take it over. Um, and then there's a third option, which is, this is a state, you know, it's not technically a monopoly, but for all intents and purposes, this is a state-sponsored monopoly. We give a franchise to HECO, it dates back at least 100 years. And you know, you can, give that franchise to someone else. You can revoke it, you can do a lot of different things where you basically say, you're no longer allowed to operate on Oahu. We're gonna break this franchise up into two. We're gonna give one to a generator, we're gonna give one to a distributor, come one, come all, come bid, and we're gonna pick the best one for Hawaii. And it's actually in Florida, where our franchise doesn't specifically give a time limit for that. In Florida, utilities have to renew their franchise every so often. So some states allow that, they say, you can operate for a set number of years and then we'll evaluate you and see whether you should continue. George. Uh, when you mentioned that uh, uh, next area is rather like a large uh, octopus grabbing a hold of, you name it, uh, Florida, of course, and the, the states adjacent north and then Texas, Oklahoma, and whatever else they have. It, uh, it's, so, uh, my question really, I used to be on the neighborhood board here, and every time Ann Kobayashi showed up, I asked her, what does the transportation contract with the Italians look say? What is, bring, it, bring us copies. And she never answered. And uh, I thought, well, what's the PUC 
or the uh, HEI and uh, NextEra contract actually read like? Does, what does it say? Write down black letter. Um, and we, we can actually answer that. And um, actually, it's about 90 pages long. Good. The, the <laughs> section on who pays whom $90 million if it doesn't go through is, is like 10 pages long and so complex I can't understand it. But many of the contracts in the proceeding are either public records or restricted to the interveners or are restricted to non-competitor interveners or restricted to the consumer advocate and the PUC or restricted just to the PUC, depending on their nature. But there are a number of contracts which are that we've been pouring through. I think NextEra is sitting on a large pile of money that they have to invest. And they have invested in fracking and other kind of more risky endeavors. And to offset on their books, they also need to have lower risk propositions like a regulated utility in Hawaii where you're guaranteed a rate of return that looks low risk to offset these high risk propositions. So it's all about investment. They can invest this money grow and it allows them to do other more high risk investments elsewhere. Um, they want to do this nationally, I don't think they're really picky about where, but regulated utilities look like a good deal to them. What about the connection with Coke? No, they're, they're not Coke because Coke is like screw climate change, screw renewables, and these guys are like renewables or a tax break heaven. So they're not on the same page. If they own them. <laughs> yeah. Marcia. Yeah, I have two concerns. One is this is beginning to seem to me a lot like the Halliburton problem that happened mm. in California. And you can rec recap that for the audience if anybody doesn't know about Halliburton in California. It's that really interesting. The other one is at one time there was a, the governor, governor made us a, a indication that he was strongly in favor of buying Hico and making a public utility. Do you know where that stands now? What's, what is the political feeling about buying eco and making it public. Okay, um, you want to? Sure, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> jump in. So I, I don't know if the governor has actually ever said about buying eco, but he has strongly indicated that he um, is in opposition to the next era murder. Right. And he's also said, and I think um, deserves a great deal of um, praise for, he said he's opposed to big importation of LNG doing all the infrastructure that we should be committed to 100% renewable energy. And, um, you know, it's usually we kind of complain that politicians don't show leadership, and so when they do, I think it deserves praise and, and it should be um, pointed to. Um, the, a number of political leaders got together relatively recently, about two weeks ago, there were about 40 or so state and county leaders who got together who said that they support it. And again, 40 is a huge number. Think about it, there's probably about 110 city and council legislators and state legislators all combined. So at least 40 of them got together at a press conference and said, we think we should be looking at a publicly owned utility. So I think there is a fairly high level of public or political support. I think that should be conveyed. Like there's popular support and at a high level, political support for looking at this. I don't think anyone's coming on saying, best thing since sliced bread, we should do it right away, and this is what it's gonna look like. Because frankly, we need to evaluate it, right? We need to know how do you finance it, how do you, you know, you could have a terribly incompetent person coming and running it. Like, I mean, there's, there's things that have to be done and done carefully and thoughtfully. But again, we're at a crossroads, and I think it would be a dereliction of um, political leadership to not look at this, and I think it would be a dereliction of us as a public to not say this is something we think should be examined. You know, in the grand scheme of things, how are we going to be served the best going forward? And, and I think two two points on that. One, the 40 was because they had, Chris Lee had 48 hours to put together a group, and he wasn't able to contact everybody. So, for example, Maui Council had only one person, even though the mayor is talking about a municipal, and a municipal, you need the majority of the council to support. So clearly, there were people who were supportive of the 40, who simply weren't able to get together at that time. You, uh, Marsha, I think you were talking about... Uh, Albert. Albert. No, no, I, I'm gonna, the other thing you were talking about. The condemnation, a 
California shyster came to Molokai and said, I'm going to make your island 100% renewable. And Miko put up resistance, and the former governor said, well, I could just condemn it and transfer it to the California developer. And he, because it was a half-baked plan in the first place, um, I, I don't think there was a, a lot of reaction to the governor. You don't just come in and say, um, I haven't thought about this, but why don't we condemn? Right. Uh, you, you need to think about it, because you can make a really, really bad mistake if you don't think about it. Nancy. Thank you. Um, I'm learning a lot. This is, um, I'm pretty naive about these issues. And what's coming up for me is a process question. Um, I'm hearing all these different options. And admittedly, my first personal reaction when I heard about Nextera was, was a cooperative publicly owned um, system. But I wasn't sure if that was even doable. So I'm glad to hear all these 40 plus are behind it. But isn't the question right now that's coming up before the PC next era or not next era? I mean, these other options are, like you said, it takes a lot of thought, a lot of planning, and that's not really what's on the table right now either. It's a question of what really is on the table or not. Yeah, okay. so that's because the question. You, you could say it's just next era versus not next era. You could point out that the PUC has 16 separate issues they've asked each of the parties to answer. And so it's more than just that. But you also have everybody arguing about what's on the table and what's not on the table. So for example, in the direct testimony that NextEra filed in April, they said, smart grids are not on the table. In the August filing, they said, smart grids are still not on the table, but in a few months, we're going to file something with the commission that's going to analyze smart grids with and without the merger. And although we're not going to tell you what the analysis is yet, we're telling you as part of our filing now that smart grids make sense as part of the merger. <laughs> so it's really fuzzy what's on the table. And, and right now, the PUC has not removed anything from the table. Um, so if you put something on the table, somebody can object to it. But so far, everything is just being piled on the table. Let me, let me answer the question this way. So I, I agree that legally speaking, I think the decision before the PUC is squarely yes or no to this takeover of HECO, legally speaking. But pragmatically speaking, right? they're thinking in their heads, Point Electric's got issues, Nextera's got issues, which one do we choose? And I think this conversation is important because it kind of puts out a third option. There's maybe a better path, that you don't have to approve this out of desperation. You know, thank God someone from the mainland is coming along is going to solve all the problems. They don't have to have that mentality that perhaps Hawaii can continue to take leadership of itself and keep local control and, and move forward in a good path. I mean, I would succinctly, you know, how I thought about it first was the things that NextEra is offering or promising is access to a lot of money, cheap capital, and experience with renewable energy. Well, the response would be, is, again, a publicly owned utility actually has access to a lot more capital at even cheaper interest rate than you could ever get. So access to capital. And if you look at NextEra's experience with running a utility, they have very little experience with renewable energy. It's almost predominantly um, either coal, natural gas, or nuclear power, with very little amounts of renewable energy. If anything, Hawaiian Electric has a lot more experience in running renewable energy. So why not? If we were to do a publicly owned utilities, we try to hire someone nationally who has experience in renewable energy and put out a management contract and get the best and brightest to come in Hawaii because there's a lot of interest in proving you can do it here. Let's get the best. Sorry, I, I diverted there from your question, but I, 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 if you're testifying, I think you have to testify. I'm opposed. We, we have four lie. questions I see. So that gentleman there, you, yeah. Okay, okay. thank you for the conversation. The conversation. I have a threefold question. The first part is this. Has Hawaiian Electric and the power plants been assessed on their plant and equipment useful life? So if we look to replace those plants in the current condition, what would be the cost? That would put Nextera's offer more into a comparative sense of what they bring to what's already here. The second part is this. If the efficiency less than Delta T for this electric company is embarrassing, why doesn't the Public Utilities Commission 
You're supposed to regulate a government monopoly. Why have they failed consistently to make sure that Hawaiian Electric operates at that delta T and prevent these rolling brownouts that we realize all over? Not only here in Oahu, under, under uh, Mau uh, Hawaiian Electric, but Miko and Hiko and the rest. So your thing about eminent domain, it's not going to work. Hawaiian Electric's license is only for Oahu. It's not for the neighborhood. That's a point of contention, and if you're a lawyer, you're going to have to adjudicate that. So my question is this. Where is Hawaiian Electric in terms of efficiency? Two, where is the Public Utilities Commission, who's supposed to, by the fiduciary responsibility and mandated by law, to legalize this public utility? And why have they failed? And the third thing is this. Under Abercrombie, didn't he blanketly authorize by some executive order or something a power purchase requirement of inventory by island so that every island is already detailed to produce so much KW by a certain means of distribution so that there's wind power on Maui, there's uh, geothermal on the big island. So that's to say this, we already have a law that's on the books, that's already been accepted. So theoretically, you could wake up in the morning and somebody could be putting a windmill in your backyard and there's not too much you can do about that. So I would think this, dancing around with the money from next era, what they're doing in San Diego or Colorado, is totally irrelevant. Let me, to let, me. On, let me finish. <clears throat> we need to focus on what's going on here, because my observation comes from the net level, because I'm paying for this utility. Now, am I paying for the utility because of the political cronyism that's going on, that allows the KW rate to escalate to the highest in the nation? No, I don't, can you answer that? And I, I, can, I can answer, I'll answer, I think, three of your questions. First, in 68, Kiko bought Miko. In 70, Kiko bought Helco. In 89, Miko bought Molokai Electric. So Hiko, Hiko is the legal entity. What part did they buy Young Brothers and American Savings? Um, that was in the early 80s. But the point is that the, the only way of challenging that would be to intervene in the proceedings, convince the PUC that they're wrong or appeal it to the courts. Since nobody did that, they are the legal entity in charge and HECO is the master. They own all the utilities except for Kauai Electric. That's number one. Number two is... The well, where's the PUC in all of this? PUC because there was the, no intervention? They just blindly just let it go? No. There was a docket opened. There were proceedings open. People were allowed to comment open. They issued a ruling. Kiko is the entity that owns everything except Kauai Electric. Second issue is we are entering a period of extreme disruption with solar. Solar is growing so rapidly, it's growing at 40% installations per year around the entire world for the last 15 years. At that growth rate, it would be everything within a decade. That disrupts all your planning and all your analysis and all your studies. The third is the life, how long a generator lasts. The um, two power plants, the two generators in Honolulu Harbor um, by Aloha Tower, they were built before statehood. They were recently decommissioned not because they're stopped operating, but because they're so inefficient. They're filled with nitrogen to secure them so in case they're needed, they can be reactivated. But currently, new generators, and Parker Ranch on the Big Island did this analysis, you could put in new, highly efficient generators in this state, and you would save so much money, you would be able to buy out the generators that still are around, but are really antiquated. Well, I mean, actually, I think, you know, the result of Parker's study was it was cheaper for them to build new generating plants and put in all the wires than it was to acquire Helcos. Just to give you an idea, essentially wow. saying Helcos higher assets. So these are steam, steam driven boiler generators? Or renewable energy or renewable. What about the Waiau power plant? Because half of that plant, the parts are manufactured somewhere in the early 1900s. Those manufacturing plants don't even exist anymore. Yeah. So the replacement I mean, I think, parts I think, I, are molded. I mean, I That's think, a matter of fact. I, I, mean, I, I, think, I think the point being is that, yes, those are going to be replaced. 
Um, and it's likely a lot of generation of plants can be replaced, but it's unlikely HECO's gonna do it. Because they can't afford it. Well, they can't afford it, but more so, we're putting those up for competitive bid and trying to get the best, cheapest replacements for it now. Well, my that's question how is, is doing why it. did they fall into disarray when you have a public utilities commission that's supposed to regulate this, this public monopoly? <coughs> yeah. Where were they? And now you're gonna be for these same guys? You're gonna make your case? I mean, that just seems somewhat ludicrous. Hey, Aloha, how are you? Uh, my name's Roger Hanks. I'm actually from Kauai. I'm here um, on a job interview for a company by the name of Helix Electric. Helix Electric is a company that built a seven megawatt plant in Alley Alley, or solar farm. A little nervous, excuse me. 14 meg in Kaloa. <clears throat> and we're all under KIUC, or like victims of KIUC. <laughs> so, um, I think you're dead on, and I think truly without going into this ramble, because um, smart meters, uh, let's see, the CEO of Kauai, $200,000 I think he's going up to this year. The board, or all, their board members, I think are all going up to like 126 or something like that annual. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the unanimously, like in 86, I think I moved to Kauai, they were going after Wailua River and these yeah. um, water pods, hydro. KIUC with Kauai Electric kind of got their foot in the door. Whammo, my friend, I have several, it's got split, it's a little bit of a mess because it's a small island, so my friend uh, is an engineer at the plant, so we go in and look at the jet engine generator. Uh, in bed with the fossil with uh, pack fuels and I mean it's just a mess so again without rambling our question a gentleman by the name of Adam Asquith not sure if that any that oh, yeah. rings a bell Adam so um, left field water rights actually are under a mineral right coverage and KIUC is going after the mineral rights, which, uh, which is the water rights of Kauai, which has a substantial amount of water. So in, in a nutshell, um, I think the issue is the PUC primarily, and this is a numbers uh, game. But, but can, can we, I'll answer that quickly, and then because it's very, very complex issues, and I, I think it's outside generally of this, but I want to answer it in two ways quickly. One is that only you only need 7% of, of meter owners on Kauai to get on the board because 90% of the members do not vote. And that's one of the dangers about a co-op. First, you have, it's not one person, one vote. It's one meter, one vote. So you only got one vote per household. And second, nine out of 10 households don't vote. So, so you can say that Kauai Electric has, KIUC has screwed up in all kinds of ways, but if you simply doubled the number of people who were actually voting, everything would change. It would, definitely. I mean, I think that's factor, but um, I think there's a, um, as regular members without solar, they bought, we buy, or whoever would buy, I think it's 43 and point something, let's call it 45 cents per kilowatt. If we have solar, they buy back for 13, or well, it was 17, then it went down again, to 15. No, no, no. I, again, this is very complex, and Robert and I can spend eons talking about this issue. And, and we but, enjoy doing it, but, but part of our fear. But part of, <laughs> part of the issue also is that the PUC normally tries to balance shareholder interests with ratepayer interests, because there's a conflict between owning and being a customer. And therefore, the PUC regulates that to, to deal with that conflict. KIUC, the shareholders and the ratepayers are the same block of customers. And therefore, the state legislature instructed the PUC have far less regulation over KIUC because there is not that inherent conflict. In half of all the states in the United States, co-ops are not regulated at all by the Public Utilities Commission. But we can go into the specifics of Delta T and, and MMS and all that separately. How are most co-ops funded? Are they funded by state bonds or how are they funded? 
They get their money from two sources principally. There's a national association of co-ops. You don't have to belong, but most belong. They have a, um, a bonding arm next to them, and they lend out money to help. And credit the, swaps. Okay. The second is the U.S. Department of Agriculture has a rural utility service that also lends money. It should be pointed out that the average electric co-op in the United States has 12,000 members. And 50,000 is very large for a co-op. So co-ops tend to be small. Municipals tend to take the next block, the block that has the larger number of customers, less than a shareholder owned. But traditionally, if you look at the number of members in a utility, co-ops have the smallest, municipals the middle, and shareholders the largest. Um, I have a simple question, maybe a simple-minded question, but one maybe that's an extension of uh, Nancy's question. And that's uh, Monday morning, I want to go out with a sign. It already says uh, next era equals next era. I think we're probably all against the next era thing. What, what should we be advocating for, though? And that's to each of you and even the people in the audience that have a position on that. What, what's that's, that's very, very easy. The PUC has said that the interveners are not to participate in the public listening sessions. And therefore, Life Alliance official position is we will not advocate that anybody take a position on any side of any issue. We only say that it is an important issue. You should all be there. You should all voice your opinions. But we will not advocate your position at all. We will not tell you what you should or should not do. I see. I mean, I, I think showing up to hearings is really important, making sure that you're there, making sure that voice is heard. You've had most of the interveners come out in opposition. You've had the governor come out in opposition, but now is the chance for the public to speak. So making sure the public's represented um, is important. Um, what's the next step? Like, you know, like, let's say, for instance, the next era is no. What's the next step? Um, again, we're presenting some of the options. Like, and again, there's, there's no silver bullet. You know, like splitting up utility generation, you know, like there's a bunch of different options. But I think the important thing is to have a consistent voice saying, hey, we want cheaper, cleaner, reliable, you know, sources of power um, that's, you know, hopefully self-sufficient, locally done in a way that, you know, we're not subject to fossil fuel prices spiking up and down and all those impacts happen. I mean, go on and on and on, but, you know, succinctly, that's what the legislators and, and the decision makers need to hear. Thank you. Yeah, can I just kind of ask, this is another simple question, but I mean, it's kind of, I want to kind of bring together what you've been saying, because I don't have a whole lot of knowledge about all this. At this point, as somebody asked, this is the question between Nextera and HECO, but HECO, at this point, could, could we go to the testimony and say, we don't want Nextera taking over HECO, there are other options that would be better and basically, we don't really want a privately owned company. So then there's co-ops, which are small, and municipals, which might fit the size of HECO. I, I should clarify is, one point. Is that correct, I've heard, or am I wrong? I've heard a lot of people say it. You're not offering testimony. The, the oh. hearing is not required by law. The hearing is not anything official. The Public Utilities Commission has voluntarily decided on its own that it wants to listen to the public. The listening sessions. And therefore, the Public Utilities Commission is holding listening sessions. But, but okay, I, I, so I, testimony I, was I, the wrong word. I, 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 would, I, would, I would answer your question with a yes. You can absolutely do that. I am opposed. If you want to say a reason why, that's fine. Said I think there's better options out there, and that's what we should be exploring. But all, all I want to say is that PUC didn't have to listen to everybody here, but they want to. Yeah, but so they're, they're not going to They're going to say nothing. But nothing. The, when the Department of Interior came, talked to the Hawaiian community, they just sat there. <laughs> but and everybody said no, and they went back and they said, hey, all of mine said yes. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but there's a reason in this case. 
<laughs> there are 30. Oh, man. There are, there are, <laughs> unlike that one, in this one, there are 30 parties that all have legal rights. And it would be improper for the regulatory body to say before the evidentiary hearing, before hearing the discussions between the 30 parties, before hearing the cross-examination, it would be incorrect. And it's what the Supreme Court ruled in the, is looking at in Mount Achaia, where the um, Board of Land Natural Resources came out and said, here's our position, now let's have the case. And that's, and, not, but, that's, that's not the case. <coughs> the board acted uh, as if the condition was already adjudicated, and it wasn't. So they took the place of the court. So now they're before the state Supreme Court on a procedural thing and a violation of their implied trust and responsibility. Why they breached that? That's what they're. And, and it would Man, be let me just say something. You, if you're talking to these people, you're not really giving them the straight story. You should talk about credit swaps. So they're not they're not disillusioned between the municipality and the local co-op. These credit swaps were to allow the things on the mainland to work. These utility companies cover the entire continent of the United States, but they're only operated in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So how is it that this company in New York shares that same equity base? It's the credits that they make from the production of their utility that they swap across the nation that keeps the thing low. And if they manage it just like managing the economy, that's the idea. Now, if you're going to do that here in Hawaii, what are you going to balance it against? What are you going to float this against? So they're going to, if next era comes in, they would be able to float that against the national economy, which would make them look good. But in essence, what? And that's why my yeah. argument is this. What are you replacing? What is the value of going electric? No one's talking about that. that so you're gets talking into, about what it's going to be. Well, what is it now? What is it value? That gets into some extremely technical, it gets into something called risk. It's like this. You're either broke or you got money. It they're gets, basically in, it broke gets into some, broker. it gets into something called ring fencing. It's an enormously complex subject, and I really think if you want to have that dialogue, we should have it separately, because it's way above what, what you need to be at the October 7th process. Uh, sorry, Randy had his hand up uh, next, and then we will go uh, Alan and then George, correct? We'll go to George. Is that okay, so who talks so two questions. Is more better, and if, it is, if the answer is yes to that, what are the main barriers having more with Tesla? Um, so let me say, uh, full spirit disclosure, I now obviously work for a solar company, so you know, um, take this as you will. But if we're going to achieve 100% renewable energy, yes, we're going to need more rooftop solar, we're probably going to need other forms of renewable energy too. Um, barriers right now are parts of this business model, I mean it's, it's, it's utility resistance, you can go back to 2008 when ECO proposed a moratorium, you know, and on and on and on, there's just been consistent reluctance, quick to identify problems, slow to find solution. Um, it's going to be partially technical, right? We're going to have to start doing storage. And the good news is that you can now do solar plus storage, uh, again, cheaper than the current utility rate. So how do we do it in a way where we're encouraging people to do that and encouraging them to be assets? Like we're really trying to make sure customers become a part of the solution. Uh, I don't, I don't want to walk out on this because this really gets off topic, but I'll suggest very quickly that one option is like, for example, the time of use rates. So you see the price of electricity. If at noon it's really, really cheap because we have lots of solar power, everyone should see that price. If it's a lot more expensive at 6 o'clock, everyone should see that price and you're encouraging solar customers then to do storage and to potentially put the power back out at 6 and you know and help everyone out. Um, and we should thank Next Era for coming here because it's heightened the energy level of the crowd of the entire community. <laughs> but if the Next Era deal was not going on right now before the PUC, they would be tackling the most complex docket they've ever tackled. So it's going on in parallel to this proceeding. And that's called distributed energy resources, mm -hmm. in which a, no a dozen or more parties are discussing everything from the technical issues of interconnection, engineering technical requirements, reliability standards, pricing models, cost structures, and rate impacts. And so that's a two-year effort going on before the PUC right now that gets hidden from view because everybody is involved in this top one. But we're involved in sort of the other one. Sorry, Alan, next, and George. And uh, it seems to me that uh, the most hopeful 
uh, sign on, on the horizon has been that meeting of 40 uh, legislators and other officials a couple of weeks ago. Uh, what can you say in terms of what's coming out of that, what is their next step, and how can we help them? Sure, I think Representative Chris Lee deserves a lot of credit for helping organize that and put that together. I think there's um, a commitment to help fund a study to look at these technical, legal, financial issues to at least model out what would this look like. And so it would have to be a state and county partnership, right? Because I think each county is quite a bit different and the decisions made on the Big Island is going to be a lot different than the decision made here. But the idea is that looking at it on a statewide basis is um, prudent, it's cheaper to do it that way, and potentially you're going to have economies of scale that are beneficial if you're to do it that way. Uh, but unfortunately, I think realistically for the legislature to allocate money, we know they don't start till January. Um, but I would, what I would suggest you do is that you support that, is to tell the people who um, signed on that, I, I support you, I congratulate you, and if you don't see your legislator on that list, tell them. I, I would love for you to support this, right? And, and theoretically, I mean, you say what could happen, so let's go with the extreme case. In the 70s on Kauai, there was a case called Nuko Ligi. And in that one, the legislature passed a bill just before a regulatory body was to rule on something. And that regulatory body, and I believe it was the Supreme Court that said that the, even though it came very late in the picture, it came before the decision, and therefore the regulatory body had to account for that action. So theoretically, if this decision doesn't come out till July, and the legislature were to pass some bill in May that was signed by the governor, it could be binding on this outcome. So that is, is one sort of extreme. The other extreme, if we talk about extremes, is that yes, 40 legislators have come together on this, but there's a lot of internal struggle between the Senate and the House and the different factions that are going on there. And come May, they're still discussing it, nothing passes. <coughs> so anything between that range is possible. It could be this big a range. So where's the city and county in all this? Uh, they're a big consumer of electricity. The city and county of Honolulu has played the least role in regulatory issues before the PUC of any county. They are rarely there. When they are there, they're practically always wallpaper listening. The one exception is the Board of Water Supply is there this time, and the board is basically, if you satisfy our concerns, we're fine. But we're opposed until you satisfy our concerns. Bernie Martin has introduced a resolution committing the City and County of Honolulu to look at the public utility option. It has not been scheduled for hearing yet. Um, and so that's one to poke on. But I think he's publicly come out and said he thinks we need to be looking at publicly owned utilities. He said that to the media. So uh, take that as you want. So Sorry, it could be anyway. I promise to come to George next if you don't mind. Yeah, very briefly. Uh, in the B section of the paper, farther back than that this morning, maybe you two saw it. I don't get the paper. <laughs> <laughs> Which kind of paper? <laughs> anyway. It said that, that uh, uh, he or next tariff is looking for volunteers to be on their side because there's so much outcry on the other side. Us? What? <laughs> <laughs> she just laughed. Anyway, they and they, they get to. It sounds like they're recruiting, and yet we're told that we're not supposed to be saying anything for or uh, no, no, or against. No, 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 no. The interveners. The, the groups that are formally part of the PUC process can't say anything. The public is free to say whatever you want. Yeah, but if you've got to be a specialist to say something else about evidentiary matters. No, 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 you're not saying anything about evidentiary. You're just going to the PUC and saying, no, no. I love it, I hate it. That's all you need to say. That's I'm all you need to say. I'm an expert. Every time I get my electric bill, I'm an expert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I do think... Um, uh, Eric Leeson was quoted as saying that he was disappointed in 
the uh, proceeding because he didn't think the parties sitting there represented the public interest, which I interpreted as there's not enough people in the thing that are supporting us. We don't like it. But I would point out that the Pacific Business News, which is not exactly a liberal or you know <laughs> environmentally friendly kind of uh, organization, just did one of those informal polls where they said, "Are you support? Are you support, opposed, or you know undecided on this?" And I didn't see a single Sierra Club move on petition directing people to this. So I think this is just basic PBM readers quoting on it. 80% answered they're, they're always been opposed and are still opposed to the next hour merger, which I think is kind of indicative mm. of if you can't even get PBN polls <laughs> to support you, then, you know, yeah, it's not a popular move. But the thing I was referring to was not in that uh, poll thing. It was a, I, it was I, a I, handout. Uh, I understand. No, they are actively looking for people. They've been going on a road show. They've been everywhere. They're meeting people. They've spent a lot of money. They spent. Yeah, how much are they paying people to do this? Maybe we need jobs. Well, so I mean, they've hired. Yeah, they've hired community organizations. They got community organizers out there talking to people. I mean, they are spending a lot of money on this, and and you know. They hired Jennifer's a boss that's been widely reported. I mean, they've hired some big names, and they're out there trying to push people. So that's why it's important for you guys to show up, because if if you guys think, oh, I'm busy and I don't go, people are being paid to go. So, you know, that's an issue. Um, just to well, go you haven't heard yeah, 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 yes, back. thank you. Um, I've only lived in Hawaii for 30 years, so I don't have a vast historic background here. But I wondered, and I think from that experience, I know the answer to this, but I don't like to jump to conclusion. I'm a mathematician. Um, is there any analogous situation in NextEra's previous business arrangements to what ours would be? Oh. I would answer no, because if, if you look around the United States, and you look at intermittent solar and wind on modern grids or semi-modern grids, and you look at how much wind and solar penetration there is, the, the rates across the nation are, and around the world are much lower except for places that have large states that they can balance. So Germany, for example, has a fair amount of renewables but they export to four major European countries and import from four other major European countries, not counting the little trades. So some of the countries are able to balance it, but if you look at high levels of wind and solar on the grid, Maui is unquestionably the leader in the world, wow. followed by Molokai and the Big Island. And therefore, we are going through, we are starting the leading edge of if you remember the cell phone issue where so we used to have these big bricks and we were like, wow, and the first ones you <laughs> paid for, if somebody called you up, you were billed for it. And, and, and now we have the cell phones which most people don't even use for calling. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're at the very leading edge of a fundamental shift in energy. Wow. And batteries are sort of coming behind this solar revolution. And Maui is ahead of the state, and the rest of the state is ahead of everyone else. So the question of what do we look for as a model? Well, next era, Florida Power and Light in Florida says that in the year 2024, Florida Power and Light will get 1% of their energy from renewables, and it will be mostly biomass. <laughs> so clearly, they are not the model of how we go. It, there are other utilities around the world that are fighting similar things, but they're behind us. So we're at the leading edge, and the question is, next era might want to acquire us because we're going to develop patents on how you integrate wind and solar, and then they can... But do I understand that there is no analogous situation to Hawaii where Nextera is currently functioning. That was what I wondered. Yes, in they, other they, words, if I go online and I type in uh, Toledo, Ohio, because that's where they're functioning, I can see how they worked there. So, I mean, so, to me, it would so, be nice so, to know if they are working someplace else 
that is analogous to us. If I understand correctly, there, as usual, is no place analogous to Hawaii. Well, so, so let me explain it this way, that they have, generally speaking, well, they have 900 subsidiaries, they generally speaking have two entities. They have a renewable energy building entity that goes into states and says, we'll build your wind farm, solar farm, we'll build it, and that's how they've come into Hawaii, and they compete with everybody else. They try to say, we're gonna do it cheaper and cleaner, you should hire us. So that is the renewable energy building arm. And then there is a utility arm, which is Florida Power and Light. And if we want the advantages of them coming in and building stuff, they can still do that. They've done it in the past, they can do it in the future by coming in and competing and saying, we want to build your new plant, whatever it is. But as far as where they run a utility, the only example is Florida. And that's the one where a lot of the concerns are. Um, sorry, you haven't asked a question before, so. You, uh, you mentioned that if the merger doesn't go through, somebody's going to have to pay somebody $90 million. So who has to pay whom and where does that money come from? And then my other question um, has to deal, well, I'd like to know what the environmental impact is of battery storage. Mm -hmm. right. um, so the first question is a penalty clause. So there was a penalty clause if one party backs out. So if like Hawaiian Electric were to back out, they'd have to write a check to NextEra. At this stage, it, it falls all in NextEra's court. If things fall apart, um, it's not clear to us, and we've had an email exchange that we have to resolve this. I'm sorry, I can't give you a straight answer. If this, um, if they were, if next were to walk away tomorrow, they have the obligation to pay the 90 million to HECO, and HECO's actually done financial planning for next year, predicting they're going to get this 90 million. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's unclear. It's unclear if the PUC says no, if a check has to be written, and, and I just don't know the answer to that. And, and that is uh, literally, it's 4,000 words. Yeah of the most convoluted legalese you can think of. And so, I don't know of anybody who has understood that. The PUC asked a question to try to understand it, and Nextera wrote two pages or three pages that was even more complex, and then said, refer to this earlier document. <laughs> so, I don't know. Your second question is the environmental impacts. It used to be uh, manufacturing batteries was a terribly horrible environmental process with lots of adverse chemicals. Um, a lot of independent bodies have now looked at how batteries are made, so that's actually really significantly improves the manufacture of them better. And once you have them, they're highly desirable from a recycling perspective. How about lithium Super mining? I've heard bad things. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to readily admit that I'm not an expert in this. What I did when I first started researching this, when I was at Sierra Club about three years ago, was look at a lot of the independent reports and say things have gotten a lot better. It used to be like, almost like strip mining, this place is just a wasteland, but you know now it's gotten significantly better. That's, that's all I can tell you, just reading other people's reports. But generally speaking, once it comes into Hawaii, it's a highly desirable item. Like For example, you see a lot of electric vehicles now, which have hundreds of pounds of lithium ion or something equivalent in them, and when those get depleted, you know, like there's going to be somebody standing in line saying, I'll pay you money to take your batteries, because I want to recycle them and reuse them and make new batteries from them. So and I'm not as concerned about that issue. Just and, and pointing out, if, if you're very, very concerned about the toxic impacts of batteries, you should not use cell phones or um, video. <laughs> 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 so it, it is, and, and there is, a, it, it's all kinds of chemicals, all kinds of different processes are being used. It is a revolution that is just beginning. And, and, and again, the contrast is to coal burning, for example, the mercury that, you know, hun, you know, hundreds of pounds of mercury get dumped just here in Oahu, you know, of coal, which means you get the mercury warnings and not, you know, I mean, you have to compare it to what the alternatives of climate change, et cetera, so. It is 8 o'clock. How many more questions do you want to take? Do we want it? Five. Five. <laughs> <laughs> well, we quick. I have a very quick question. The board of legislators who met, how can we go online and find out if our guy was there or woman? Um, what, what are they called? Or what was the meeting called? John, if I sent you a list, could you make that available? Yes, I can. I can pass it on. Oh, great. Okay. And it cut it, it was one of the widest cuts across the spectrum of people who you would think would be on any legislative yeah. list of allies. And, and it's kind of unprecedented. I've never seen something like this happen. So it was, it was a good, good refreshing thing. 
Um, as far as the uh, investments that you were talking about next year, uh, you must remember that a chunk of it goes into uh, donations to local politicians in Florida and now in Hawaii. Right? So whereas we have may have 40 legislators that come over into the cameras and announce the right thing to do, the wrong thing to do, uh, next year is an election year and mm -hmm. politicians don't understand two things, votes and money. So if we don't have the money, we should have the votes because whoever is going to be given the most amount of money to them, then they're going to be following that. The utilities largely decided the gubernatorial election in Florida last cycle. And part of the reason why is you had one candidate who was very outspoken on climate change and the impacts on the Everglades and one who was not. And obviously they helped get the one who was not elected. I think the grand total spending in that election is around $5.6 million just from utilities. I'm deeply scared of that type of influence happening here. And utilities, at HECO traditionally does not give money. They show up in mass. So uh, we, we, we saw one, an example where a legislator did not record any money coming in from the utility, but two thirds of the people who showed up for his fundraiser were from the utility. So they show up in other ways in Hawaii. Nextera tends to spread money out in many different areas but they predominantly give to Republicans who believe that climate change is a myth. Can you Next question. October 27th, Honolulu. McKinley, McKinley High School. Uh, two, two questions, one having to do with Hawaii's potential and the other just verifying on next year's track record. It seems to me uh, as though Hawaii uh, could lead the world. I mean, that, that we have everything. We have wind, we have sun, we have water. It, and, and you also, I think, said that those are becoming less expensive than fossil fuels. I so, mean, so we, yes, yes, we can lead and we are leading. Every right. national conference talks about Hawaii. Everybody I call, any state, you're from Hawaii, tell me more, I want to know more. We yeah. are leading. So, I mean, we got to do this. Yeah. But the other question was, I think I'm hearing you say that next year it does not have a good track record on, on renewables. No, correct. Correct, in fact, if you, if you were to look at the two branches combined, you say, okay, they build wind and solar farms, they have a utility, combined, how much renewables do they have? Combined would be 16% about, 16%. which means that we're ahead of them already, and we're far ahead utility-wise because they're at like less than 1% in Florida, and we have 70,000 solar panels, solar, rooftop solar that are either installed or permitted. So we really have to act to realize our potential. Yes, but but the the one myth <coughs> that, I, that I find interesting, let's say interesting might be the right word, when we started down the renewable energy path with the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative in 2008, it was a recognition in the agreements, but not in the press, that the initial drive towards solar and towards renewables would increase the rates. It would stabilize them, and then they would go down. So when people react and say, oh my god, Solar came in, wind came in, my rates did not go down. That was part of the plan because you need a certain momentum going that you, then rates start right. crashing down. Right. And today, solar and wind can beat any, re, any fossil fuel. That's amazing. And, and you even had, you just had an announcement in KUC that they are going to be installing a solar plus storage um, facility, utility scale, that can dispatch power whenever it's needed, that is cheaper than any of the fossil fuel sources coming in today. Wow. It's exciting stuff. That's amazing. Um, sorry, so I think we're in question number three, question number four. <laughs> uh, yeah. so in your opinions on next era brings no positive impact to Hawaii at all, right? I'll give two positive ones, okay? Because I, I don't want it to be totally one-sided. In all the regulatory proceedings we've been in, we've asked Hawaiian Electric to, to say, look, more and more documents are available only electronically. We want emails. We want the electronic documents associated with what's going on. And Hawaiian Electric always said, like, no way. We're not going to do it. 
in this proceeding without being asked, next year or start producing electronic documents. So that, that's one positive impact. Uh, <laughs> he's picking at slender reads. I mean, I think part of this discussion has been important, right? This is a huge, important discussion, and now we're talking about a lot of other things that are kind of important for why that, frankly, didn't get to this level of public discourse, and I think that's been really positive that we're now having these conversations. Like, where are we headed? Where are we going? What is it going to go look like? And I think that's been beneficial. And, and the second is that NextEra is really has fired up the community, whether you're for or against it. And we talk about saying the PUC can go yes or no, but the two options really being considered by the PUC are yes with conditions or no. I, and I don't think anybody thinks they would approve it yes without conditions. And if they did with conditions, the Department of Defense suggested like 28 pages of conditions, so it's not like one or two. But, um, so, it's yes with conditions or no, and we really need to thank Next Era for raising public awareness and to get people fired up across the state. Last question. Uh, will you be doing more of these? Um, if you want either of us to talk, we are really cheap, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll, I'll, come, I'll come for free word, free water, you know, like, you know. Um, I think we're happy to talk and happy to engage. I mean, Henry's done a really good job with his blogging, and if you're not on his blog list, talk to him. I'm sure he'll get you on it. Um, I think we're happy to keep educating and talking and learning more, too, because I think we always learn both ways. And, and I, this I, would be great if it brought to multiple communities. Impossible to get to everything before the 27th of October. We were at Kona two nights ago. Um, I mean, we, we happily, and I think more people too. I mean, there's a lot of people, and you know, involved in this issue, and I think that's that's great. Give a round of applause to our foundation.